Baker from the Traces Center for History and Culture. It's a small World War II history museum based in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, and the bus is one of our exhibits. It's about the 370,000 Germans that were captured in Europe and North Africa, brought here to the States, brought to the Midwest, and eventually eight to 10,000 men wound up in Michigan. Uh, there were about 28 POW camps in Michigan. Uh, there was one right here in Alma. Because all our men were gone fighting the war, there was a labor shortage. And it was ultimately decided to bring the POWs here and put them to work and to fill that labor gap. And the camp here in Alma was on Court Street. There was an old uh, uh, sugar milling factory, and the POWs were held there and worked there. Uh, in the Michigan area, in this area, uh, the camp in Friedland uh, is now the MBS airport. That held about 1,000 men. There was a camp in Owasso and a camp in Lake Odessa, a camp in Bay City. Um, it was all sugar beets. Uh, in this area, in the southwest, it was orchards. In the southeast was uh, potatoes and onions. And in the Upper Peninsula, the men worked in the uh, forests and in the sawmills. Uh, the, their work, um, it turned out pretty well that they were brought here. Um, they were paid 10 cents an hour. The government, the unions complained that that 10 cents would uh, undercut the civilian pay. So the government told the employers that they had to pay the, the going rate. The government collected that difference. The government paid out uh, 10 cents to the men, collected anywhere from 40 cents up to uh, 90 cents an hour for the men. The government made between 100 and 130 million dollars off the labor of the POWs uh, from 1943 to 46. It more than paid to bring them here. It more than paid to feed them, clothe them, and, and house them. Uh, in fact, there was money left over that actually went into the war effort. So it, uh, it was a uh, it was a win-win situation bringing the POWs here. We made 370,000 friends by the way we treated them, and then the government uh, uh, it, they paid for themselves in, in the way in their labor. Uh, the bus itself is the overview of the experience. We unfortunately don't have anything spe specifically about the camps in Michigan or the camp here in Alma, but uh, the bus. The panels on one side tell how the men were captured, where they were captured, how they were brought here. The panels on the opposite side tell what life was like in the camps, what the camps themselves were like. Uh, and then we have uh, four cases filled with artifacts that uh, the men had with them either when they were captured or had with them in the camps themselves. Yeah, my father was a World War II vet, so particularly it's important to me. How about you? How does it fit into your story? Uh, my father uh, was born too young to be in World War I and too old to be in World War II. Um, and none of my, uh, uh, well, how I'm affected is uh, my, my mother's family was wiped out in the Holocaust. Oh, wow. Um, uh, my father's family, uh, brother and two sisters made it here uh, before the war, but uh, my mother's family was all, all disappeared. Well, we appreciate you coming here, and we're really looking forward to getting a tour. Will you take us on one? Oh, certainly. It'd be my pleasure. Irving, can you just give us this? Uh, now, this side of the bus is? Uh, this side tells how the men were captured, where they were captured, how they were brought here. Um, the first, it's their numbered panels. Uh, this uh, is the introductory of what life was like before uh, uh, the war in Germany. Panel two is very interesting. Um, every POW had a ID picture taken and an ID card so they were kept track of. This gentleman was 17 years old when he was captured. He's five foot four, weighed 118 pounds. He's a tiny little child. Too yeah. young and too, too, too small to be in war, let alone to be a POW. This pants, panel tells how the men were uh, brought here. Um, 15,000 on a ship, the Queen Mary, was used as a transport. Um, most of the other ships were our Liberty ships, the ships that were bringing our, our men to, the, to, to Europe. Why send them back empty, fill them up with POWs, put an ocean between the men and the war. Um, and um, if they try to escape, they essentially have no place to go. So uh, the Liberty ships were these 300 foot long floating corks, basically is what they were on the ocean. And uh, um, any, any vet, World War II vet that served in Europe could tell you the horror stories of what it was like going across the, the Atlantic on these 300, ship, 300 foot ships. Yeah, you mean with the seasickness. Yes, yes. And plus the thousands of men. 
uh, how how confined it was, how cramped it was, and how sick it was. <laughs> Can, can we point out some of these artifacts down here? The helmet um, is a unique. The German, um, if you can see the, the ear flap, the German army was the only army in World War II that used that ear flap. The most important part of your head is the, is the back of your head where your brain is. They were the only army that, that uh, covered that and protected that part of the head. The U.S. Army did not adopt this style of helmet until the Gulf War in the 1980s. Yeah, it's interesting. Our hel modern helmets look a lot more like that. Yes. Um, <laughs> the dagger um, is actually a British commando knife. And the gentleman that we got that from in Germany either traded with the British soldier to get it or killed him to get it. Um, that's, uh, and then you just have other personal effects in there, um, the eyeglasses. And eyeglasses, the, the uh, old shaving brush, uh, an ink bottle, which probably people these days have not a clue what that is, but mm -hmm. there, there were fountain pens before there were ballpoint pens. It's interesting. I see you have small crocheting needles. Are those knitting needles? Yes, knitting needles. Uh, the men um, darn their socks, mend their socks. Um, and uh, if they had that in the camp, they would have been uh, making uh, probably scars for themselves or, again, uh, fixing any, any of their clothes. The Indian head is uh, interesting. Um, in the 20s, a, a, a German author came to the U.S. and became enamored of uh, the, the Wild West and the, the noble Native American. And he went back to Germany and he became the Zane Grey or Louis de Moore of Germany and wrote a series of books about the Wild West and they were wildly popular and widely popular. Everybody read them in Germany. So when the POWs came over here, they thought of the Midwest, the, the U.S. As, as the Wild West still. And a lot of the artifacts that they, that they created are of Indians and Indian symbols. And that was done, that piece is a uh, Back in the old days, uh, 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 apples and oranges came in wooden crates, and that's the end of the, the end piece of a orange crate. And he did that with a nail. That was his tool. Was a nail. Boy, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's a pretty amazing. Um, uh, the, the expression and, and 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 the detail that they went into. The diary um, was from Camp Crowder, which is uh, outside of Neosho, Missouri. And I was in Neosho, and a, a, a German-speaking woman came on the bus. So we opened up the case, and we opened up the diary and, to see, you know, hey, some history here. Unfortunately, the gentleman who kept that diary was not a very good writer. Uh, it's page after page. Today I wrote my parents. The day's date and how many lines. Turn the page. Today I wrote my parents. How many lines the day's date. Turn the page. Today I wrote my parents. There's nothing, unfor unfortunately, there's nothing in there about what the camp life was like, what his, his thoughts of being a prisoner are like. It's just, today I wrote my parents. So it's really unfortunate. I think it is artifacts like this to me that really bring it uh, to life. Because you can see as someone holding that book or playing with those cards or even filling that pipe. And as you can see the dice there, I'm sure these uh, these uh, POWs, just like POWs all over the world, are have more time than they know what to do with. So they got to fill their time. And it's nice to know that there was things that were done, at least during this time, that were really productive for some of these uh, men and even added to culture and value. Irving, can you tell us something, some of the, um, some interesting facts about the things in this case? Uh, the photo is from the mess hall at the camp in Algona, Iowa, which is in uh, uh, the center of Iowa, about 30 miles south of the Minnesota border. That camp was uh, uh, the base camp for Iowa, Minnesota, and the Dakotas. It held uh, four to 5,000 men, and from that camp they went out and worked at the branch camps in Minnesota, uh, the rest of Iowa, and in the Dakotas. There's a uh, can of tooth powder. And uh, you young folks w don't realize that there used to be a, a step between toothpaste and, and brushing your teeth. You had to add water to uh, tooth powder in order to get the toothpaste. And also, the, uh, this generation has not a clue what the, this green piece is. It's a, a potato ricer. Um, and that would make potato pancakes, and, uh, uh, which are th 
potatoes uh, exa- just like a pancake, and, and you would fry it. And uh, I guess the hash browns would be the closest to uh, to what that would be. And they were either all green or they were all red. Huh. You, why was that? You know, I have no idea. It's just uh, I would ask people, and oh, say I've seen that one, but I had a red one. And and it, after I talked to people that have seen these, they said, oh yeah, mine was green or mine was red. Mm-hmm. So they brought their food and their customs along with them. Yes, yes. How well they were treated is they have puppies. (laughs) They're allowed to have their own animals, uh, puppies. They put on plays. Uh, They had a pool table, so they actually had recreation. They had a boxing team. Um, There was, uh, every camp had a library. Uh, every camp put on uh, plays. Every camp had uh, their own band, put on both uh, orchestra, um, symphonic music, and popular music. Um, they had, of course, art and drawing, and uh, they even had uh, classes. They could earn college credit by taking classes in the camps. So uh, uh, the men were treated pretty well, and um, they appreciated the way they were treated. It's interesting to me that some of the pictures show the men still in their uniforms. Up until um, ni- December of 1944, the POWs had a choice of they could wear their uniforms or they, or they could wear their POW garb. In December of 44, the military realized Germany was losing the war, so they made a, a uh, nationwide and campwide decree, no more wearing uniforms, no more giving the Nazi salute, and no more singing patriotic songs. So that, that changed as of December of 44. But until that time, yes, they, they could either wear their uniforms if they, if they wished or uh, put on a, a, the POW denim. Uh, some may say, why give these prisoners this kind of treatment? Uh, and what was the rationale behind that as far as the U.S. government was concerned? Um, the POWs basically ran the camps themselves. Uh, the, the Americans uh, um, were in charge. And, and had the guards, but the camps themselves uh, uh, and discipline of the camps were left up to the POWs themselves. So it was just, um, we're not going to inf- interfere with your lives. Just go on and do what you want to do, uh, uh, up to a point, of course. But uh, um, uh, so that was, they were pretty much given free reign, and you can do what you want. And I was remembering when uh, I think you were saying, one of the reasons that they did treat them so well is because they knew that the German government would be watching how their POWs were being cared for. Therefore, therefore, our POWs would be treated better, and that was in fact happened. Um, our POWs were treated much better than the Soviet POWs, of course, but even better, a little bit better than the French and British POWs. But that also paid dividends in, in other ways, too, that the word got back that the German POWs were being treated well to the army. So towards the end of the war, they were more willing to surrender more than fight. So that actually wound up saving lives, that, that they wouldn't fight so hard to, to, for, their, for their fatherland, for their homeland, that they, would, they knew that they were going to be treated well, they could surrender, and they did. You could surrender and live instead of surrender and be killed. Exactly, exactly. And also, um, at the end of the war, those men, the way they were treated when they went back to Germany, overnight they went from being uh, enemies to being allies, allies in the Cold War. Um, They were the front line in the the propaganda battle. uh, Well, the the younger kids have no idea about communism anymore, but there was a war of ideas between the capitalist United States and um, uh, communist Russia and communist East Germany, and those men became the front line in that battle. They were able to tell their countrymen, don't listen to these lies and this propaganda coming from the communists. We were in America. We met Americans. It's a wonderful country. They're a wonderful people. Uh, again, so how you treat people, you create friends or you create enemies. We created 370,000 friends. So it really comes back to you, the, the proper treatment, exactly. even of your enemies. Exactly, yes, yes. And, and if you, it can be brought forward to today of the way we're treating the men in Guantanamo Bay. Are we creating friends or are we creating enemies? Also, there's just a number of books that you can purchase here. All our books, uh, we are a traveling library. Every book that we have is autobiographical, and they're all from World War II, telling either our POW stories or the stories of the POW, the German POWs, 
or the stories of uh, people that, that what they went through during the war. We have one book, it's a wonderful book, written by a girl growing up in Germany as an anti-Nazi and, and all the courage that that took. Her uh, father was a pastor, um, a Lutheran pastor. He was put in a concentration camp three times, but because he was a well-known pastor, they couldn't kill him. Do you know which book that is? Uh, yes, it's called uh, um, Out of Step. You can see that book right here. And uh, I highly recommend anybody who is interested in, in uh, uh, what life was like in Germany. The Heart's Closet, the one next to it, mm -hmm. Everybody knows, or pretty much everybody knows, about the Japanese-American internment camps. There were also 15,000 German-American citizens put in internment camps. And that uh, author, she was born in Brooklyn of German, German parents. Her father was falsely accused of being a Nazi. The FBI came by, took the entire family, put them in, a constant, uh, in an internment camp, and in the middle of the war, sent them back to Germany. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, could you just, I know uh, this book you had spoken to my wife about, because this is a beautiful book, isn't it? Yeah, it's a wonderful book. It's uh, The illustrator lives here in Michigan. Um, the book was uh, uh, published by the uh, Sleeping Bear Press in Chelsea, and it's the story of the uh, Berlin airlift. Yeah. And the, the Mercedes was uh, um, a little girl that lived out by the Tempelhof Airport that would see the planes coming by every day. And... Uh, one of the pilots started dropping uh, chocolate bars. They would put in uh, uh, his own handkerchiefs and uh, tie them into parachutes and drop chocolate to the kids. And she went out to the airport one day to get a chocolate bar, but she was too short. And all the taller kids grabbed the candy bars before she could get one. So she went home and she wrote him a letter. Um, she raised white chickens and, and she said, um, I raise white chickens. I live out by the airport. When you fly over and you look down and you see the white chickens, would you please drop the candy bars? And the guy got a kick out of the letter, um, wrote her back saying that would be kind of difficult, but here's a, a, a package of chocolates for you. And she kept the letter, and 30 years later, she actually met the gentleman, and he signed the letter. Mm -hmm. And uh, every year that uh, they would have contact with each other, they would send letters back and forth, and it's a, it's a wonderful children's book. It just reminds me, too, in the most difficult of times, there are still people who step out in love to show love to one another, and, yes. and, and, uh, and you see that in these stories, as tragic as they are. Yes, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. it's, it really is amazing. Yeah, but you're exactly right. It's the little things, just the, these mm -hmm. little things that, that, that just mean so much. Yeah. One of the things that I noticed as I went through, and it just, I guess you kind of think of that these, these men were soldiers, what could they do? But as you can see from the artifacts that you have and the stories that you have, there were some artisans, artists, and really trained, skilled laborers. Yes, there were architects, there were sculptors, there were painters. Uh, just as we had, our men were, were of all walks of life, so were their men. There's a wonderful story of a gentleman um, who was a sculptor was held at a camp, uh, Breckenridge in Kentucky. And he, while he was a POW, they allowed him out of the camp. He went to a, 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 an abbey in, in Indiana and sculpted two s statues, 10 feet tall. And then he came back after the war and created a 15-foot statue called Christ on the Ohio, or Christ of the Ohio. And it's a statue of, 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 of Christ overlooking the Ohio River in, in Troy, Indiana. And um, he also created murals at the camp in Breckenridge in Kentucky. Uh, there are still artifacts remaining of, of murals that the POWs painted in the various places that they were kept. Uh, yeah, it's amazing what uh, the artwork that they were that they were that they created. It's uh, we have I, I guess we, when we put together a, an exhibit in Iowa, we had 1,500 pieces of artwork and sculptures. Yeah, I think it really brings apart uh, brings a, uh, the whole idea of the humanity. You know, these are real people. They're not uniforms that are falling when someone's shot, right. or or it's not. I guess it's just, for me, it helps bring back that war is about real people like you and I yeah. uh, who find themselves in extreme situations. It's the governments that, that fight the war, it, that starts the, start the wars, and it's the people, common people and artisans that, that wind up fighting it.
The last third of the bus is a little theater, and this theater runs a looping video that gives you some tender and interesting stories of the experience of these POWs, and not only of them, but of the people who lived and worked alongside them. And so it's really a human story of interaction with people, even in very difficult times, and the love, concern, and appreciation they had uh, for one another. I really think it's a reminder of the brotherhood of man, even amidst uh, real tragic and difficult times. Well, Irving, thank you so oh, much. It's our pleasure. Thank you so much for doing this. It's, uh, it's our pleasure to be here, and uh, we thank you for your interest in, in doing this, too. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very nice of you. Well, keep up the good work, and uh, we just need to remember the things that happened, significant events in our history, and World War II was one of those events. Oh, to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, it was the last war this country fought with a 100% effort. Every single person in the country was, was touched and, uh, by the war, mm -hmm. and that hasn't happened since. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, uh, it's now down to maybe 5% or 2% of the people are touched by the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it was so different then. Uh, the, uh, um, the military and, and their victory, and, but w the sacrifices that the civilians made too, uh, um, uh, the uh, rash gas rationing, sugar rationing, flour rationing, the victory gardens. Uh, you would get one coupon a year for a pair of shoes. Uh, people don't have having a clue how to sacrifice these days and what the sacrifice that their grandparents and great-grandparents went through to win the war. And, and thank you for watching. We appreciate you tuning in. And uh, we're just glad to be able to present something like this because it's part of our cultural heritage here in Elma. And I think it's also just part of our public education. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>